Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, but I haven't interviewed him in years. I'm really excited to talk to him, though. He's the CEO of Curzio Research. He's the host of the wildly popular podcast on iTunes, actually the top financial podcast on iTunes over many cycles, Wall Street Unplugged. And he's been writing paid investment newsletters for many years. His father was actually a well-respected newsletter writer, used to have conversations with Warren Buffett. His newsletters include a large cap flag- flagship newsletter, the Curzio Venture Opportunities, and uh, his specialty, he's actually considered one of the best small cap stock analysts on the planet, the Dollar Stock Club. Frank Curzio, thank you for joining me again. Jason, I didn't want to come in. I was going to let you keep going with that intro. Thanks, man. <laughs> Well, you've accomplished a lot in your career. I mean, I, I was listening at my day job. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this publicly. Well, actually, like I'm not working a day job in the investment newsletter business, but I was working at a competitor. And I was listening to your podcast uh, while I was getting my work done, my research work done. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we have a podcast of 15 years, believe it or not. So one of the longest running podcasts. Everybody has a podcast now. And it's really special because you know it's free and people say, well, you do this free podcast. But uh, as you know, when you do these things, the network of people. Uh, I think people are just smart in different ways, right? People would say, okay, even there's 30 years, you know, the markets and stuff, but there's people that own businesses that are in these industries that are going to know stuff in real time compared to what you see, where all the data is lagging, especially economic data, right? Where you can know how much uh, a gallon of milk is is going up in price or, or gasoline prices. Your next door neighbor is buying, some, buying a new car and, you know, they're a fireman. They got two Mercedes. You see these trends going on and, and you can get a lot out of it. What's going on to you? Not just the economy, uh, but how it filters down to certain stocks and, and whether they're overvalued or not. And the network has been built uh, incredibly. It goes out to 100 countries, something uh yeah, I'm still humbled by. I can't believe people actually like to listen to it, but I'm going to keep doing it as long as people listen, I guess. So we're recording this interview for our listeners out there on Thursday, July 6, 2023. I want to get your thoughts on the general views of the different asset markets here in the US versus the real economy, because we've had kind of an absolutely crazy stock market rally, but it seems what is only about seven stocks have made up the majority of the rally. What are your thoughts on valuations and stocks and other asset classes versus the real economy? Yeah, so... so- uh, a lot in that question, uh, and we need to cover it because if we look, I think it's a top 10 stocks account for 32% of uh, now the S&P 500 and just 21% of the profits. Uh, it's funny because we were told, and even my career, I've been doing it for 30 years. You mentioned my late dad who did it for 30 years before me, You know, talking to me at six years old about stocks and the, the business table. But you know, earnings usually drive stock prices. Growth drives stock prices, right? That's what we see. Uh, and that's what we've learned for years and decades and decades. And now we're seeing a market where in the last six months, this massive move driven by you know, a select few companies in technology and two trillion, three trillion dollar valuations. Uh, and in the middle of this, earnings are declining year over year, right? We're in an earnings recession. Uh, we're seeing the Fed raise rates by the fastest amount uh, in the Fed era. And a lot of confusion was in this market, and I would go on record saying that doing this for 30 years, this may be the most dangerous market that I've ever seen. Uh, now, that's a bold statement because you may be saying, well, Frank, what about the credit crisis? What about COVID? The credit crisis is so serious. You had that, you know, the red light, get the hell out. Let's sit back and watch what happens if we can come back in. Same with COVID, right? The beginning of the COVID, we saw, you know, again, I'm from New York and now I live in Florida, but uh, when COVID first hit here, we were fortunate. I had great contacts in China, be able to report in January, February, know exactly what was going on. Uh, we knew it was going to be really bad. And when New York, you saw a lot of people get you know, just infected with COVID. And what do they do? They put them in retirement homes, right? Not knowing better, no responsibility, no politics or whatever. And the death rate was 10%. Right. So 10% of people got it with dying at the beginning. So it was craziness. Right. But even in the market conditions like that, you were like, holy cow, let me get out. And then lockdowns, let me get out. So this market's different and it's so dangerous because it's forcing you not to get out. And when you see these moves and the FOMO, fear of missing out, where you're seeing these stocks continue to go higher, it's like this atomic bomb that's sitting in your house and you, you don't know when it's going to go off. Uh, but every time, every day you stay in your house, you're making more and more money. And you're like, well, I'm just going to stay. I'm going to stay. And eventually it's going to go off. And, and it's scary conditions because we've never seen a market like this in history. There's nothing that goes back. People say history repeats itself. If you saw 
you know, the Fed, if you if you see Yellen, you see everybody talking about the markets. And just think about 18 months ago, right? These guys study charts. They're smart. People want to tell say that, you know, just Powell's an idiot. These guys are crazy. Everybody hates the Fed. I know it's, you know, everybody says it. These guys uh, are just, they study. They understand charts. They understand figures, the economy going back decades and decades, even when the Fed, you know, first established, right? Decades and decades ago. Uh, and 18 months ago, based on everything that they know, they said that inflation is going to be transitory. You have nothing to worry about. It was the worst coal in the, in the history of the Fed era. They didn't understand it because we never injected $11.5 trillion into this market. And by the way, I understand there was lockdowns. We had these lockdowns 2020, but at the end of 2021 in January, all asset prices hit all-time highs. You're looking at home prices. You're looking at stock prices. You're looking at collectibles. Anyone who owned assets was in a great position. And what did the government do? They spent another $4.5 trillion injecting it into the market. And that's why we're seeing this confusion where – you know, I can give you 10 indicators that show you we're seeing deflationary pressures and then look at the jobs number, look at wages going higher, the housing market. They're trying to say at bottom, housing prices have gone up, the medium home price in the US has gone up for, for five straight months. Uh, so if you think the Fed's done raising, you're crazy. So we have the Fed raising in an environment where we're seeing loan losses go higher, we're seeing the economy really, you know, start to deteriorate, the underlying fundamentals and consumers struggling. Uh, that makes it a dangerous market because it's forcing you to go in with terrible fundamentals, not a lot of growth, almost zero growth for a lot of these companies outside of AI, uh, or you fear of missing it, right? And that's why it's so dangerous. And there's a lot of cross currents, as you just described. It seems also that there's a lot of, you mentioned the Fed and the currency and the liquidity creation or currency creation, money supply creation from the Fed and the uh, commercial bank supply is coming down lately here in the US. However, if you look at the amount of currency that all the central banks created, it wasn't just the Fed, it was all these central banks from 2020 to 2022. There was many trillions and we still have some of these other central banks. The Fed has been more aggressive than other central banks at raising interest rates. So a lot of new liquidity from the other countries is still coming into U.S. capital markets. Yes. And when you look at other countries, this is the thing, right? Usually you point to growth, and, and this is why we got out of the market where China China closed in January, right? It closed in late January. Our market started to really crash in the third week of February. Uh, Apple closed the stores, Young Brands closed, Starbucks closed, everything closed. Uh, that was the growth engine of the world. I think we would have hit recession uh, even if we didn't have COVID, because we saw earnings really top out. They didn't grow from 2018 to 19. They actually were up like a dollar, right? So they were barely up, and, and you're seeing valuations really, really stretched. Uh, and then you just closed the growth engine of the world. So that 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 was a signal for us to really say, okay, you know, let's get out, you know. And, and I didn't know COVID was going to be that bad in the U.S. and how crazy it was. Uh, but that was pretty scary, and, and we were able to get out of the market with with you know just looking at that. But now you look at China. I mean. Yeah, they just defaulted uh, on bonds, right? So, so on uh, real estate bonds, if you're looking at some of the numbers coming out of China, a great context there, and I know you do too. Uh, it's it's really really bad. Like they're talking about numbers that are worse year over year. And last year, China was closed. <laughs> so, you know, so where's the growth going to come from? If you look at Europe, look at the European nations. I mean, terrible. We've seen high inflation in, in the UK. We look at Germany, still have problems. Energy, uh, you know, okay. If, if, they have inflation and their economies are barely growing. I mean, you have India doing okay, but you know, where is the growth going to come from? Even emerging markets. I mean, these it, it surprises to see that this rally is taking place. Uh, there was a lot of liquidity injected to the market the last six months, but I think a lot of people didn't, didn't factor in. But if you're looking at the next six months, guys, it's there's a lot of liquidity that's going to pour out of this market. And when you look at charts, of the massive liquidity coming in. Massive liquidity came in 20, 2021. The market did great. Massive liquidity came out of the market 2022. The market crashed. More liquidity came into the market in the first six months of the year, believe it or not. And now what are we seeing? Well, now they're going to go back to paying their student loan debt, which is 43 million Americans, $400 a month. Uh, do the math on that of how much. I mean, tens of billions of dollars every month coming out of the market. We cheered, right? It was the greatest thing ever. When, when you look at the debt ceiling, right? We raised it. Thank God the world was going to end, right? So everybody told us. Uh, but now it's 1.2 trillion that the government has to raise. Where's that money going to come from? Well, it's going to come mostly from banks. They have reserves of 500 billion. Now they have to raise that money, and that money is going to be coming out of the market. You're going to see a lot of liquidity drained out of this market. Uh, and let's see, because you know when we saw that over the past three years, uh, in terms of how much in trillions going in and out of the market. Uh, we'll look at more than a trillion coming out of the market now. Uh, and with these valuations and where they are, without a lot of companies seeing growth, uh, it's a very dangerous market. And you should protect yourself. It can go higher. I mean, people said the market was overvalued in 1998. And they were right. 
But the Nasdaq doubled in 1999, right? And then before it topped, it crashed 75%. So, you know, when it was 2,500, they said it was overvalued. It went over 5,000 and went to, to whatever, 800 or something. But you never know how far high they can go. So I'm not telling you to sell all your stocks. You just have to be selective in your allocation of where you're going, you know, the risk that you're taking, be in the right areas, but protect yourself and not shorting. You could buy puts, long dated puts. This way you don't lose the money you go in, but but be smart in this market because when it does come down, you want to be in a position like every single market crash, uh, in a position to buy assets that are relatively cheap because that's how you become extremely wealthy, right? It's not just making big gains, but when you're buying some of the stocks like in the bottom of, of the credit crisis uh, where 22% of the S&P 500, the best stock companies in the world were trading uh, below $10 a share, you know, those are 10X, 20X gains you could see over the next 10 years. That's how you make your money. That's where you want to be in position when this market, because it's going to happen. There's not going to be a soft landing that can't be. Uh, so just prepare yourself. It's a, it's a dangerous market and be in the right areas. It's the old Warren Buffett quote, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And I think we're in greed mode right now because people are just saying, you miss the stock market rally. It's it's FOMO, like you said, fear of missing out. But if you're a contrarian, you're saying, well, I made money on these stock trades. I need to start trimming positions here. I need to start building up cash. Or if instead of cash, I mean like the Fed's going to pay you with short-term treasuries to park cash there or money market funds. So that's what people are doing. But then that's causing problems for the regional banks. So the, the regional, the, the um, entity, the group of companies that are actually getting screwed the most, I would say right now, and I think it's a ticking time bomb. It reminds me a lot, Frank, of 2005, 2006, 2007, because we were seeing all the negative stories back then of subprime housing crisis, residential real estate problems, but we hadn't seen any bank failures or anything super serious during 2005, 6, 7. I think in 2007, I think Bear Stearns had a few hedge funds crack and people just explained it away. And then it was another six to eight months before we had a, you know, the bank stocks start to crash. It reminds me a lot of that with the Fed hiking rates, causing damage. Um, but this cycle, I don't think it's residential real estate. I think it's commercial real estate. And I think the the major problem zone is the regional banks because of the Fed rate hikes, the rapid pace. Have you ever seen a uh, bull market though in stocks with an inverted yield curve though? <laughs> so not only the inverted yield curve, which precedes every recession since the 1950s, and it's been inverted for a while, right? But but it's it's never been this inverted recently. And this is like the past couple of days. It's never been this inverted since the 1980s. Uh, and, and the same environment, right? We had massive, massive inflation. And what do we? What did the, the Fed have to do? The Fed had a. The Fed has to force a recession in order to control inflation. Now, why is inflation their top mandate, and and not like, hey, we want to make sure that we don't push, you know, banks out of business and stuff like that? It, it, it's they need to get this rate, the inflation down to two percent, because when inflation is low, the Fed has an incredible amount of power to stimulate the markets. When inflation's high, they don't have as much power. They have very little power, right? Because they can't stimulate the market. They always had a floor into the market, right? For the last 10 years. We got used to zero interest rates, constant QE, which is, you know, unlimited amount of printing, and they're buying mortgage backed securities and treasuries. That's flooding the market with cash, right? So every opportunity that the market went down for 10, 12 years, it was by the dip, by the dip, the Fed's there. The Fed's not there anymore. So, you know, we talked about allocation and things like that. One of the things I do like is, you know, stocks that are buying back a lot of their float, which, you know, you might think that's Apple $90 billion buyback. Believe it or not, it's just 3% of their float. Uh, this stock, this company is a great balance sheet that are buying back a, a huge portion of their stock. And, and that's the floor you need because if the stock does come down, what are they going to do? They're going to actively buy it. Not only that, what does it mean if they're buying back stock? It means that they generate, you know, excuse my language, shit love cash flow. Right? They're generating a lot of money in a market that in difficult conditions. And those strong fundamentals, if the stock does come down, they have very strong fundamentals where if the whole industry comes down, now they're in a position to buy their competitors, uh, they're in a position to buy back stock, to increase their dividend. Uh, you know, So I would really focus on companies like that right now. That's a good area of companies that are buying back a significant amount of stock because that means their balance sheets are very, very healthy. And that's what you want in a weak market. I mean, those people hope that the market comes down because they're able in good cash position to buy assets that they're cheap and, and sometimes buy their competitors. Well, as long as those companies are not using debt for the share buybacks, because there's been a scheme with the zero interest rate policy and the Fed kind of mm -hmm. capping rates for what, almost 15 years, what a lot of those large caps were doing is they were doing share buybacks with debt. And then the insiders would sell their shares at higher prices and the buybacks would soak up the insider selling so the share price wouldn't crash. So that scheme was going on for a while with financial engineering and EPS juicing. But uh, I mean, you know what? Nobody cared. Mm -hmm. You know what? Nobody cared about that strategy because stocks went higher. 
kind of like with SPACs, right? So when, when stocks went higher, they could argue, okay, yeah, that's right. We're taking out debt, but we're buying back our stock and we're benefiting. And that, yeah, now I, you see SPACs and everyone's like, wow, SPACs are going – remember, SPACs were like terrible. Nobody would touch them like years ago, right? They had this whole trend, no SPACs, and talking to SPACs, they're garbage. All of a sudden, they became popular because you got the retail investor to buy over $10 a share as these things came out where SPACs are – they're a liquidity event, right? It, it allows in the insiders – uh, to take a, a private company where the liquidity period is seven to 10 years, and liquidity period means when could they sell out? And it usually takes seven years, which is an IPO, or if, if they get acquired. Well, now, if you merge it into a SPAC, which is already publicly traded, a shell company, now, not only do you, you don't have to disclose the warrants you own, you don't have to disclose the pipe deals, right, which are amazing, uh, but now your lockup period is four months. So you hype this thing up like they do with Virgin Galactic, right? We're going to be profitable in two years when it came out you know, in, in 2020, whatever. Uh, we're going to be profitable and we're going to send people to space in, in 18 months. And you didn't even get to that point. Chamath sold out for 200 million. You had uh, Branson sell out for 300 million in the 30s. Uh, this thing went to three. And you know people are wondering who's selling you at 10, 9, 8. It's all the people, all the funds and the pipe deals that got the stuff for 50 cents a dollar. So you know it's good until it's no good. And like you said, you know, using debt to buy back stock, nobody cared about that strategy because stocks went high. Everybody makes out. It's different now because debt is very, very expensive. So you're not going to see a lot of companies take out debt to buy back stock right now. It's just too expensive. Yeah, cost of capital. Mm, excuse me, cost of capital, especially for for small caps. Cost of capital for debt versus equity. Debt is much higher for cost of capital for for small mm -hmm. caps. But I, I'm with you. I'm in the David Einhorn camp for share buybacks. If you have free cash flow and you're running a company and you think your shares on evaluation are cheap. Uh, share buybacks with free cash flow are tax efficient here in the United States compared to your dividends, which by the time the shareholders pay the dividends the at the corporate tax structure rate and the shareholders paying the dividends are triple tax for Americans. So the average person doesn't think about that, but the corporation is looking at that. So I think with free cash flow, uh, as long as you're, you think your stock is cheap, I think share buybacks are tax efficient um, compared to dividends now. Yeah. And I looked at this and I, I was blown away by this. I didn't know this. So I just studied this. Uh, you know, I was looking at research in, in the past month and I looked at companies are buying back their stock in the past 20 years uh, and, and also dividends. They outperform dividend paying stocks and they also outperform the SP 500. And they took the top 100 that bought back the highest percentage of float uh, and it significantly outperformed the SP 500. And I was surprised because that's a pretty conservative strategy. And 60 million Americans own SP 500 funds and, and, and you know, XBX, and Spiders, and, and whatever. Uh, and I was blown away by that. And I was like, wow, a conservative strategy. But if you take that strategy in those 20 years of 2019, that's SP. If you want to look at it, just put SP dividends compared to SP, and you'll see it's a, like a, you know, whatever, 50 page report, really good research. But if you're looking forward, you don't have to pay attention. I think dividends, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this because I'm crazy about dividends, but dividends are almost dead because why do we have dividends over the past 10, 12 years? It's because we had zero interest rates. When companies pay dividend, it's they want to entice people, right? Usually it used to be where companies grew so much and growth slow that we're going to pay a dividend. Like the Apples and Microsoft started paying dividends, you know, once their growth started slowing and then, you know, it started growing a lot faster with these companies and they continue to pay two, three percent dividends. Uh, and people were searching for companies. Let me buy, you know, the dividend aristocrats or whatever, the highest dividend payers over the last 20 years that constantly raise their dividend annually, right? Consecutive years. You're getting 5% risk free. So if you're looking at Procter Gamble because it pays 3% dividend, if you're looking at that 3% dividend, forget it. Why even own the stock when you can get 5% and over 5% for free? Uh, so you have to look at the stock and say, okay, I, I'm buying Procter and Gamble because it's a really great company. I'm not looking at it because, oh, wow, this dividend is pretty cool. So you have to think about that strategy. Companies, like you said earlier, they're going to continue to pay their dividends because the insiders have big shares, you know, own shares, and you know they love getting paid those dividends. But if I'm a company right now paying a 2% dividend, I would not pay it. I would rather buy back my stock or keep that cash on the balance sheet and use it to, for M&A and acquire companies because, again, that has been used to entice people who, who are dying and starving for income. Not you and I. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I just turned 50, you know, 51 now. Uh, you know, younger generation, but think about the older generation of retirees that used to get that income in the 80s and the 90s, and then all of a sudden it's zero and they're being forced to take on extra risk and put their money in the market, which worked out with 0% interest rates. Now, 5% is a very big amount, risk-free without even bothering with all the BS. 
uh, and the craziness. And, and that strategy hasn't worked in six months, but that's a really nice risk-free rate right now uh, of, and I'm not telling you to, you know, to go into that. I'm not even telling you to sell your stocks. I just think you have to be very, very careful in what you invest in because some stuff is crazy expensive. Uh, but you should have an allocation to that uh, uh, with 5%. That's a very, very good return right now. And, you know, a lot better than buying a stock that's okay that pays a 3% yield because, you know, I'd rather get 5% risk free than buy the underlying stock, which a lot of those dividend paying stocks are pretty expensive, right? They're over 20 times forward earnings, many of them. Is there any specific industry where there's a lot of share buybacks with free cash flow right now where you're noticing, wow, this industry really has a lot of free cash flow and they're buying back an enormous amount of stock relative to the other industries? Not industry, but specific stocks. And, and that's where it takes like you and I, where, you know, we do this for a living, right? We look at individual ideas uh, and people have their own jobs and they come to us for ideas. I mean, Sandridge Energy is an energy company. Uh, what they've done in the last six years, I know energy has been terrible, with, you know, lately, you know, with oil prices coming down. Uh, but this company is buying back 15% of its float. Uh, they lower their employee count from like 80%. They're outsourcing everything. They just generate a massive amount of cash flow that they give, you know, special dividends and 15% of their float they're buying back, right? It's a massive amount. Uh, you could buy some of the technology companies, which are, you know, the exciting names that you're going to see on CNBC all the time. But there's also small caps that I'm finding, uh, and even mid caps that are buying back a large percentage of their float, especially small caps. Uh, I, I won't, I want to be careful saying this, but. You know, someone who follows small caps all my life, uh, the last time I've seen an opportunity like this in small caps to buy small caps uh, was probably maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, we could go back to credit crisis 2009 if there was a great opportunity, but even even going back to, to you know, the dot-com era, and that might sound crazy, right? Because I'm throwing these stats at you, telling about the economy, and usually, usually when you see higher interest rates, right, and, and a market like this where earnings aren't growing, small caps – usually get hit the hardest along with you know technology and risky securities. Nobody, Jason, nobody cares about small caps. And you want proof of this? We recommend a Rivian in May. Okay, Rivian's on fire right now. Everyone's going, holy cow, I can't believe the numbers. The production numbers are up. They look great now. Look, They look like they could scale. I mean, if I could bring this picture up, right? So there's a Canada Fitzgerald report, uh, and we have access to all this research, pay a lot of money for all the sell side research. Uh, and... The last quarter, they blew out the number, right? And, and what was the problem? Why did Rivian come down so much? Because they couldn't produce. They didn't meet their estimates. They had a lot of debt, right? The Amazon, they didn't fulfill the Amazon commitment, which you know, which is a hundred thousand, uh, you know, uh, vans that they're sell that they're gonna, you know, sell to, to Amazon, the largest customer. Last quarter, they they made you know, huge shipments to Amazon. They blew out the numbers. I mean, it was twenty three thousand cars they produced, or something like that. And this was supposed to be fifty thousand for the year. So this is the first quarter. Uh, there's a Bloomberg article servicing that there was an internal memo, uh, and this is Bloomberg, right? Internal memo that they, they're going to report like at least sixty four thousand cars over the first three quarters. You know, they 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 don't they didn't source it, and no one you know, whatever. But it was on Bloomberg. But all this information was available. They have eleven billion liquidity. They raised a lot of money last year, which forced forced the stock the stock to come down. All the information was there for you to see. Nobody cares because everyone's paying attention to these stocks. We have to buy it at fourteen. The stock's 21 today, and everyone's like, wow, did you see the production numbers? And we're like, yeah, no kidding. It was, I mean, did you see last quarter? Uh, you know, we're buying Norwegian a while ago, too. This is a company where you, know, you might have bought Carnival and you did okay. Norwegian uh, restructured all of its debt. So that was big, right, for, for cruises. So they didn't have the debt concerns. They focused on the on the high-end consumer. We're seeing the prices of hotels. You know, your family, you take them away, you know, go away on vacation. Uh, I think it's forty five percent less to take the you know to go on a cruise with, with your family than it is to, to go on a vacation with Disney, and we see you know that stock take off. There's there's others. Enovix that's up a hundred percent in six months, and, and I'm not cherry picking ideas here, guys. I mean, listen, in 2022 it was a nightmare for small caps. Nobody cared, but these companies, everybody knows there's a recession coming, right? So what you could see, well, as long as you could see it, you're fine. You could adjust. These companies have cut costs significantly. They, you know, they just restructured their debt. They're sitting in there where these stocks are still trading. If you look at the November 21 highs, they're 25% off their highs. So when you're looking at it and say, wow, the economy doesn't look that good and that might hurt small caps, they're already pricing in a terrible environment where the large caps, especially the technology, they're not. So when you see these stocks at 52-week highs and you're seeing these small caps who have adjusted and insiders are buying, you're seeing you know, they're buying a large percentage of their float, they're generating cash flow, they're leaner than ever. 
Uh, it's like shooting fish in a barrel right now, and I'm seeing lots of ideas. I'm not telling you to buy the whole Russell 2000, but it's I'm seeing a lot of ideas in this area to the point where, uh, you know, Jason, I saw a chart. I'm trying to pull it up here just so I could, you know, source it, and they don't have it at the bottom. So they have a chart relative forward PE for the U.S. small caps versus large caps, right? And it's at a level right now. The last time I was at this level, when it looks at a forward PE and, you know, large caps more expensive than small caps, the last time we were at this level was 22 years ago, it was in 2001, two. And the only other time we were at these levels where we saw this much uh, of just mispriced in, in terms of small caps and large caps was 50 years, right? It was 1979. This is wow. rare. This doesn't happen when you see you know, all the money flowing into large caps and nothing into small caps. And a lot of these small cap names are really, really good companies. You know, look for some of them, the insiders are buying or buybacks, but you know, they're reporting good quarters. They're showing up on our screens. We're seeing them. I'm like, why is it stock trading at this level? And I'm buying it. And then, you know, three months later, a quarter or two go by and they blow out the numbers. And everyone's like, holy cow, man, I can't believe they blow out the numbers. I'm like, well, you know, it was pretty obvious if you just, you know, if you're looking at these names, which, you know, you and I do. Do you think that this is because of the Fed rate hike? So the average investor, maybe someone on Silicon Valley, venture capitalist or angel investor that would have given these small caps maybe an easy amount of equity valuation or the small cap could have tapped the debt market at a much lower interest rate. But now because the Fed has raised interest rates so much, these small caps are being forced to be more efficient because the capital, the cost of capital really either it's not available at any price or the debt, uh, the cost of capital for debt is just way too high. It's way too high, right? But let me let me you know ask you this question: If you're sitting on a massive amount of cash and rates are going higher, that's a great thing. So some of these companies in small caps, they they don't have debt, right? They don't have large debt positions, or they restructured their debt already, right? So you know when you're seeing the high interest rate environment, some of them have cash; they're generating cash flow. That you know again, they cut costs significantly because we've known that we're going to go in a recession pretty much for. I mean, they've been cutting costs since since COVID, right? And they went back to hiring a little bit more and get a little more aggressive. And then, you know, we they saw you know, demand falling off a lot quicker than some of the large cap companies. Again, the large cap companies benefited from AI, which came out of nowhere, a great trend. And they're all going all in, spending a lot of CapEx. But yeah, some of these companies do not, again, not all Russell, it's not garbage companies in a Russell 2000. These are good companies with, with you know, billion, two billion. It's, I would say small caps are really classified right now as under five billion. And when you're looking at these companies, some of them are in very, very good shape. They've raised money, uh, you know, and, and you know they're giving away equity and maybe diluted, and their stocks have gotten murdered because of that. But all the reasons why these stocks are down 35 percent, they addressed and they no longer exist. I mean, you, if you could say the same thing about Meta, what pushed Meta down 60 percent? Okay, it was Apple, iTunes, right, changing their policy. It was TikTok eating their lunch. It was advertising coming down. And what happened? You saw advertising pick up, so they figured out the algorithm, right? Didn't hurt them as much with the privacy concerns. They created reels, right, and, and addressed TikTok. So the reasons why the stock is down 60% no longer exist. And what happens to the stock? Look where it is. So if you see stocks like that and you're looking at these seeing down 30, 40%, uh, and the reasons why they're down 30, 40%, these companies, just like your company, if your company's going down, you're addressing it. Once that risk no longer exists and you're much leaner, and you see business stock coming back, that's when you see earnings explode. And you're just seeing that in small caps. And you're seeing a rotation over the last month into this. But over the last two, three months, if you look at the performance of some of these small caps, again, we're conditioned CNBC, Fox Business, whatever you're watching, whatever you listen to, they're talking about large caps and they're exciting. Nobody's paying attention to small caps. And I love that right now. So. And I think they're being forced to be more efficient. So you're just seeing these small cap businesses. I think 3D Systems is a good one. I just looked at their investor presentation the last couple of weeks. Because of higher cost of capital, they're being forced to merge with the other Stratasys, the other 3D printing company, the combined, the, excuse me, I'm not telling people to go out and buy the stock right now, but the combined company in the presentations, they're cutting a ton of uh, overhead for SG&A and they're going to make free cash flow and they're going to have 3D printing in all these different markets with the combined company. So the combined company looks a lot better and that's a potentially long-term winner for a small cap uh, over the next three, four, five years. I've followed that industry for seven, eight years. I go to Consumer Electronics Show every year to study the newest trends for, for over a decade. I've been going there. Well, last year was pretty bad though. Uh, ever since COVID, has been that hasn't been as good. Uh, and three D printing companies had this massive trend, and they're going to be great. And then just did this, you know, a lot of them just life cycle, yeah. <laughs> and why? Because they couldn't find a way to scale. Uh, they couldn't find a way to get this to the consumer. 
just like cloud. Cloud wasn't into the consumer, and then all of a sudden, you know, everyone knows what cloud is, right? Apple cloud, every storage. When it gets to the consumer level, like AI is done, right? Uh, you know, right away. Now you have this explosion. Uh, I could tell you when I went there uh, in January, it was really cool. So I went to a 3D company and they, and they partnered with Hasbro. And what they did is they brought me over and, you know, I had my podcast. So we have like a media badge. You get everything for free uh, and access to everything. And they scanned my face with a 3D printer and they were able to put my face on a superhero which happened to be you could pick <laughs> Spider-Man or Iron Man. And they sent it to me too. I think it was like $50, $60. They did it for me for free. It was incredible. I think, like, imagine a kid. I mean, that is really cool, I would think, for a kid. And, and um, just little things like that uh, of how 3D printing, I mean, they show how they create organs and food. Is, but it's just you know, being scalable. But this is an industry, again, very early. People hate it. I know Stratasys very well. I know 3 Sys very well. You know, I didn't, those two companies are very, very good. They're smart. They've been through the ups and downs, so they know how to manage through tough times. But you know that those are two very, very good companies, well positioned. And and three D printing is not dead at all. It just they, they're finding ways to actually you know make it into consumers where people could use this stuff. Well, I'm just saying that because of the higher cost of capital of Fed right hikes, the two companies decided, hey, we can't raise easy capital anymore. Let's merge and let's cut all this overhead. Let's focus on free cash flow and doing three D printing in these different industries. The combined company, the business plan, it looks pretty pretty darn good. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and, and capital right now is king. I mean, it's very hard. You know, the mining industry is very hard to raise money. Uh, it, but if you have good projects, I mean, people uh, have been, you know, crapping all over the metaverse. Uh, you guys see over the last six months how many metaverse projects have gotten, you know, tens of millions of dollars of funding. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, Apple definitely helps, you know, getting into the industry. You know, they cut back on production. They're trying to sell their new, you know, headset for, for four grand, which is, you know, really, really tough. But they're in it. And now you have two major players in Meta and, and Apple that have tens of billions of dollars put into this trend over the next 10 years, uh, f- jockeying for position and competing against each other. That is going to be great right, for, for the future. I do know when you look at the metaverse, it, it's exciting. If you're older, you're probably like, ah, it's crazy. Look at your kids. I look at them play Roblox. Look at them building stuff. Look at them with Fortnite. They're building. They're on these things. I mean, that's the future where... If you build all this stuff on Roblox, if you build all this stuff on Fortnite, whatever, they keep it. Okay. They keep it. Even if you if you go through meta, whatever, they keep it. The future is you own everything. You own your own stuff. That was it. Chase, that's the way the internet was supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be owned by five or six companies where you have a YouTube channel. If you say the wrong thing, they, they press a button and kick you off, right? You don't realize that. And, and you know, when you die, say if you you, know, you pass away and you have all these po- like Facebook, they just cancel you. I mean, Maybe someone has your password, a family member, whatever, but all that stuff is gone. Uh, now you have ownership of your own content, which is amazing for developers. So instead of developing for the Facebooks and everything else and developing all this stuff, uh, and, and you know they'll get paid pretty good, but think about if you owned it, if you own some of this stuff. And that's what NFTs are about, non-fungible tokens. I mean, that's pretty exciting stuff. That is going to happen. It's inevitable. It's just, you know, everybody got on that board and you know, they trained really quick and, and everyone's like, ah, I don't see it. I see it. I definitely see it uh, being a very, very big market in the future. Uh, it might take a little while to develop, but it makes a lot of sense. Well, the problem I have with artificial intelligence is a lot of these products aren't actually selling yet. So you have what Chat GPT from OpenAI Systems. That's like the main product they're selling right now. And these companies are investing CapEx, but a lot of the stuff's just on hype. So far, so there's not actual products or services being sold and, um, you know, revenue growth, profit margins, free cash. There's none of that stuff yet. Exactly. And you have to be careful because, you know, as an analyst, you might say, oh, this company's garbage, but it doesn't mean it can't go up 300% because they're in the right industry, right? We've seen it, you know, how mining companies change to cobalt, to change to, you know, lithium, change to uranium, which a lot of them are all byproducts of whatever they're mining. Uh, but when I look at AI, you're looking at who, you know, NVIDIA Clear Lear, and when you look at the stages of who gen- they generate money right away, right? They have the hardware, also the software and the systems, uh, and the first to the market, but they have 70% margins, uh, which is massive. I mean, usually when you Wait, see- which company is this? This is NVIDIA. Oh, NVIDIA. Okay. NVIDIA, so 70% margins, right? So when you have 70% margins, I mean, in the industry, that's hardware- uh, and again, they have the best products, but what does that open the door to? There's a reason why you have Google, which AI significantly threatens Google. I mean, do you really need search with AI? Um, you know, but it, it's, it is amazing when you look where, okay, you're going to see Google developing their own chips. You see Microsoft start developing their own chips. These are big companies developing their own chips. Apple's developing their own chips. 
to compete. AMD, obviously, they're in the industry. But like you said, when you go down that chain, uh, these companies, it takes a long time to develop this to generate revenue. I will say, chat, GBT, GBT, it was brilliant what they did. If you want to scale and put this thing on steroids, what do you do? You release it to the world. And everyone's like, wow, this thing's really cool. But what they're really doing is they're getting information from billions of people who are all over typing every single thing they want. And, and now you have this thing constantly tracking and you're just building and learning and saying, okay, this is what the, because you really don't know. I don't know what you want. You don't know what your customers, you know, sometimes, well, you know, they you have know a, everyone's into. don't they have a free version and then also a pay version. So they're generating some revenue too. Yeah. They generate revenue, but I mean, this is massive because they, they got so far ahead. It was just brilliant because now you have, and what's AI about? If you have a startup company, that says that they're, they're incorporating AI, just short it, sell it, they're done. Okay, AI only works when you have a massive amount of data. And how did we get to this point? We got to this point because what do you need? The very first thing you need is much faster speeds. All right, went from 4G to 5G, we got super fast speeds. Then you need to store this stuff. And we didn't have a lot of space. Well, here comes cloud. Now you have unlimited storage. You have unlimited storage, super fast speeds. Then you have data analytics. Now you have all these analytics trying to predict. Then you throw an AI on top of that, which basically is used to predict the future, right? And it's as crazy as that sounds, we're all creatures of habit. We all drink coffee at the same time. We all go to the bathroom at the same time. We go on vacation at the same time of the year. We all do the same things over and over and over again. Uh, and it's just a matter of predicting what you're going to do, which is priceless for, for every advertising company in the world, right? It allows you to target the exact minute and second people are buying stuff and people- See? So you're talking about probability algorithms. So it's not actually the, it doesn't have a crystal ball. It's doing no. probability algorithms based on all the data that is gathered of your behavior, maybe your spending history with your credit card, your bank accounts, uh, what you search for online, all those types of things. So the what you mentioned, Frank, is that it's stacking all these different technologies on top of each other. So you need uh, all these other foundations first before artificial intelligence. Yes. And, and you're saying probabilities, right? When you say probabilities, okay, what is a probability? Is it 2%? Is it 10%? Well, look at Facebook where you have 3 billion users and you could say how many have active or really active, whether they report states over a billion that tell you every single thing that they're doing, right? I'm, I'm here. I'm checking in. I like this. I'm right here with my friends. I'm in Starbucks. You know, think about that, you know, doing that every single day. And now you have AI on top of that, which is, you know, milliseconds. It, it, it's it's really incredible what this could do. Just for me, doing podcasts for 15 years, I could input all of my data into everything I say. And now this thing could actually write for me in my voice and nobody's even going to know it. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it really is revolutionary. But like you said, you know, a lot of these companies, they don't deserve the trading where they're trading. Uh, you know, NVIDIA and some of the hardware companies are going to benefit the most. But let's see. You know, the large cap companies could put billions into this to really, you know, try to scale within their operations, which they're doing. Uh, but the small and mid cap companies, you know, be very, very careful because you're not going to see a lot of revenue generated for them for, for a while. Well, I, I'm a contrarian. And also I look at small caps and value investing and I'm looking for undervalued growth stocks. So from a contrarian standpoint, I mean, it's just, and also with fundamental analysis, it's just easier for me to look at the actual financial statements of the company rather than projecting, well, they could have this product and it could go on sale. I, I'm looking at what's cheap, what's hated, but still has potential growth long-term. So oil and natural gas stocks, those things look pretty, uh, there's a lot of them in the US and Canada that look really cheap. Uh, Petrobras is, has a really high free cash flow yield dividend. There's a ton of examples of this in the commodity space right now, because a lot of people think that the Fed's gonna keep hiking interest rates, they're gonna kill inflation. There's not any need to own commodities long-term, but I see tons of supply side problems for a lot of different commodities, especially food and energy, but also key base metals if uh, politicians decide they want us to switch to electric vehicles. Yeah, EV is a whole nother story. Uh, it's interesting because we just saw the major automakers report uh, their unit sales, right? They didn't report like their actual numbers for the quarter numbers. They reported quarterly, you know, vehicle sales, and they all blew out the numbers. Uh, GM, Ford, across the board, even, even Tesla. But th there was something interesting that it's not surprising the media is not covering this. This is why I like being independent with our research, where we don't get paid by companies, right? So that's kind of why we got suppressed by YouTube. We just tell it how it is, right? Uh, you know, our, if I don't make you money, you're not going to subscribe to my products. Doing this for thirty years, so you know, we have to have a good track record to be doing it for thirty years. But when I look at the EV. Uh, and this whole revolution and how we're supposed to have 10, 12 million cars in, in the U.S. And we're barely going to get to 1 million this year. 
one interesting trend I saw with GM and Ford is their EV sales, both of them, declined quarter of a quarter. What does that mean? Every single EV that those companies sell, they lose a ton of money on. So they sold a lot of gas vehicles. Uh, yes, we have the whole green movement, right? And oh, my God, you got to be in the green movement or, or you know, you're going to have people protesting in all your factories. Uh, but what do we see? We saw them cut back. And it's not supply chain concerns. I have data that's been tracking this. for People have been trying this for 30 years. It's Goldman Sachs. It is uh, two other reports. Uh, right now, the supply chain is at the easiest level. It's not in terms of tightness being the tightest it's ever been in history uh, You know, during COVID and, and like a year after that, 2022, to below 2008 levels. So there's any companies that are reporting and say they have supply chain concerns. They're lying. Okay, They have demand concerns. It's not supply chain concerns. Supply chain is, is perfectly fine. Uh, but they, Ford loses thirty thousand dollars for every EV they sell, even with the tax credits. So what does that mean? It means that when you're looking at, and if you look at, at Tesla, and Tesla is a clear winner here. Uh, they show that they could scale. Ford doesn't know how to scale. They don't have the technology. The F one fifty truck was on fire at the beginning. Now you can get them on the used market. People don't want them. They don't like them. They like these big trucks. That are filthy, dirty. That you know, you hear the engine roaring, and you know they won't, don't want to pull over in a silent vehicle and then say, "Oh, I'll be right back to their friends, and I got to charge it for for you know an hour." Right? They don't want that. Uh, however, they do want Rivians, uh, which is a, a stock that is really taking off now, and you're seeing demand because this is the first time another company could scale EVs. GM and Ford are great. They're businesses that people bought because they have massive cash flow from selling these gas vehicles, uh, and then all of a sudden they're like, "We're going all in on EVs." You know, now they're realizing, all right, let's not go in on EVs. Let's let's have it as a component of it, uh, which is going to result in EV sales not being as strong as people believe, which is not a surprise to me that covers trends. Because again, going on consumer electronics show and being in trends very, very early, you know, I, I loved I love learning new technologies. The way that you disrupt anything is it's got to be cheaper and easier. Okay, if it's cheaper than you normally pay and it's easier for the customer, that's how technology scales. That's how you disrupt. If you're looking at EVs, they're not cheaper and they're not easier. I mean, it requires you to charge it and people don't like charging. A lot of people, some people do, you know, Rivian, people are going to buy these the EVs, not to the point where it's going to be 60, 70% of the market, what some people are predicting. So I, I'm hoping Ford and GM, if you're going to buy those stocks, that they dial back and continue to dial back. They'll have their EVs, the Machis, you know, and, and stuff like that, again, to cover the industry. Uh, but Rivian and, and Tesla really separated themselves as, as two companies that can actually scale. Where GM is having trouble, all these other companies, BM, BMW has, uh, you know, I, I test drove that the, what is it, the, um, uh, the XI, uh, and it was fantastic. I mean, it was fast and everything. But I test drove it three years ago, two years ago. Yeah, you know? and, and where is it? Right, you still can't get it. So. It's amazing to see a lot of these OEMs and what they're doing with EVs, where you got to be careful because if they scale back, they're going to get ripped by the media. Uh, but the more they scale back, the more money that they're generating. And, and you're seeing that. And I wouldn't be surprised. You know, GM's quarter is going to be good. Ford quarter is going to be good. And I think that they're finally realizing, like, let's scale back a little bit because we're losing a lot, a lot of money on this until, you know, we get this technology right. So is there any specific industry that you see a long-term bull market? you think the fundamentals are clear for that industry, maybe a commodity or a type of technology? Or do you think that this is going forward in the next three to five years are going to be more of a stock pickers market where people have to look at individual companies and fundamentals, make sure the management team doesn't screw things up with debt on the balance sheet or uh, invest uh, CapEx into a product or service and then it doesn't sell and then the, the company's in trouble? You know, it's a good question. Uh, for me, I like to look at individual companies in, in growth markets. Uh, I am not a gold bug by any measure. I think gold fundamentals set up well. I'm not, don't buy it because it's a store of value. Don't buy it because it's good in, in uh, deflationary or inflationary environments. You can go back and, and look. And even, I mean, we had negative real interest rates for 10 years and gold did nothing, right? Since 2012, really. Uh, but you have to be careful buying those stocks because. They're terribly run companies because they dilute the hell out of everybody. There's a reason why, where's gold $100 off its all time high? And a lot of these stocks are still down 30, 40%. You rarely see that when a commodity is at all time high and stocks are still down tremendously. It's because they're poorly run. Uh, I think that gives a good opportunity for some of the bigger names and holding you know, the Newmonts, the Barracks. I mean, these guys, if you took the name off there and you just analyzed the companies, you would think they're software companies with their margins. I mean, they're, they're all in cost of what, 1100 and you know, gold's 1900, you know, free cash flow generating, uh, they're paying dividends, you're a mass amount of, uh, of free cash flow. 
uh, and, and now could buy some of these good junior miners with, with, with good projects. Uh, but I do like uranium, but again, companies that aren't haven't been generating money for many, many years, they dilute it a lot. Uh, and I think for uranium to really work, and, and I know all the fundamentals of uranium, I've covered it. I've been involved in private placements. I've done well for 10, 15 years. Uh, one of my best friends runs uh, one of the largest ones, UEC, um, Amir Adani. Uh, but it's it's a difficult industry. I'm hoping that it, it gets more attention. But you know, when natural gas prices where they are and how they collapse, that's a big factor. Right. And, and, you know, and the energy companies, you look at supply demand balances, they've been around for a while. You know, the energy companies have to lock in contracts. I think uranium prices are starting to go higher than mid 50s. Uh, there's certain companies I like Encore, uh, which is, you know, an under the radar company, uh, less dilutive. I think they have great properties and, and nobody really talks about that. They talk about UEC and Cameco. Uh, but overall industries, it's tough because. When you're bullish on something, think about if, you know, Jason, you look at the industries and you say, okay, this looks great for, for you know, next 18 months is going to explode. Look what, we, what happened the past 18 months. And I try, what I've learned is not to look out past 18 months. I want to buy stocks that have catalysts, uh, you know, growth catalysts that, you know, could come to fruition within six months, to 18 months. And if you look back 18 months ago, interest rates are zero. Right? We weren't in war, right? We were Ukraine and Russia. Uh, you know, interest rates again have gone up by the highest percentage ever. We had a crash in the middle of this, and all of a sudden we have like the biggest start, the biggest six months in the Nasdaq almost in history, right? In, in, in since the seventies, I mean, so many things changed in eighteen months. A banking crisis we had that really wasn't a banking crisis, right? I, I just you mentioned that earlier with with, with uh, just like the the smaller banks. Why would you even risk having your money at these smaller banks? Uh, when large caps are just totally protected, the balance sheets have never been stronger in the history of the banking industry. It's saying a lot since you know we're talking about the 1800s, J.P. Morgan. Uh, and every time these things fail, they go right to the big banks. But why even take the chance of, of having your money at these banks, you know, and, and having more than two hundred fifty thousand, which that's your insured FDIC, unless you're at uh, Silicon Valley Bank and, and you know you have deep connections and technology, then everybody gets bailed out. But uh, I see problems with those as well. I mean, you have you know, tighter markets, which are going to hurt them, where high interest rates are going to benefit the bigger guys. Uh, that's a market I, I think is a little dangerous right now. But um, in terms of overall sectors, I mean, I wouldn't call small caps a sector, Jason, but but I really like small caps here. I just, I'm seeing a lot of ideas that that are just like layups that I usually I have small cap news that are called Curzio Venture Opportunities, and we have something on our website, Curzio Research. Uh, yeah, you know, we sell that newsletter for actually five thousand dollars a year, and we lower it to a thousand dollars a year. I've never lowered because, you know, again, we don't get paid by companies, but anybody that you know comes in now, I think is going to do very, very well and pay full price next year because I don't see the opportunities that I'm seeing right now in this industry. Usually, I'll come up with an idea a month, and I'm seeing like dozens of ideas uh, that look very, very attractive. And, and you know, a lot of those names have taken off for us. We still have names that are buying the portfolio, but it's nice because. Again, to be fair, 2022 was not a good year for small caps, and, and the last two, three months have been blockbuster, and I think it's just the beginning. And uh, you mentioned gold and silver stocks. I think those companies are hated, and they have, they've had a bad reputation. I mean, there was a bear market for over seven years, and a lot of the gold stocks, other than Franco Nevada, Wind Precious Metals, and Royal Gold, a lot of them didn't do very well. Then when gold prices went up, and this is the problem with mining, when when the price of the metal goes up, the costs often go up or the grades fall. And then the mining company has higher cost of capital now. So all these problems, my, I, I would argue, Frank, I think mining's probably the most difficult business out there. So the average person who buys mining shares doesn't understand how difficult mining is. They see gold prices at 1900 and think that the mining companies mm -hmm. can mint money well. Um, they bring on a new mine and you see this with Pan American Silver and some of yes. the other miners. Okay. And all of a sudden they have half their mines are not making free cash flow, even at, even at these high metals prices. Yeah. You know what I like to see? It's important to have experienced management teams here. Uh, you know, that's something that Rick Rule always said, you know, make sure, you know, yeah, that's, that's the number one thing. I don't think it's the number one thing. I think the market's the number one thing because you could have had the greatest, you know, person in the world managing any gold company in the last seven, eight years, and you probably would have lost money on it, right? So you want to really look at, at the fundamental economics. Yeah, there was, and, there was three gold companies, three ones that I just mentioned out of uh, what, over countries. hundreds that actually yeah. did well in the bear market. Like there's a small one called US Gold. Um, and I like those guys a lot. I know them. I went to go see the project in Wyoming. Uh, and I had a fantastic interview because I interviewed a lot of people just like you do on my podcast. And uh, he just talked about how he, do, he did de-risk the project. 
um, where they have you know a lot of rocks and minerals that, they, that they're selling off, right? They're selling where but Mar- Marietta is like, like looking to buy this stuff from them. Uh, you know, they lowered costs significantly over this time frame. And, and that's what you want to see, right? You want to see them managing through, have good cash positions and, and, you know, be prepared because the greatest thing that could happen for a company, right, is when you have these bear markets, what do you do? You cut back, you cut costs, you become super lean, right? And, and when you become super lean, now what happens? You survive this market. A lot of your competitors are out of business. But now when you see the market come back, and you're seeing demand come back for your products, your earnings absolutely explode because you're so lean and your course is so low, right? And now you get to choose and say, okay, all right, we saw this for three, four months, this explosion. Now now we can hire a little bit and spend a little bit more. But that explosion and earnings that you see, you know, after companies survive like really, you know, terrible markets, and that's small caps, right? And that's what you're seeing here, where, where you know, a Rivian or a rig, right? You talk about oil companies earlier, Jason. I think uh when we say oil companies, there's so many facets to, to oil companies, right? There's midstream, upstream, downstream. You have, you know, drillers, you have domestic shale plays, you know, international companies. Uh, to me, international, we recommended a rig a year ago, another one that, that's, you know, surging and just got to upgrade uh, with a price target to nine, recommended at, at around just under $4 uh, a year ago. Uh, me too. I was writing about that for my, yeah, I was writing about that because I was looking, where's the oil growth going to come from? Because I was seeing all the stuff about the Permian Basin, the oil production was coming off. I was like, where's the oil production growth going to come from? The companies are going to have to go, it's basically back to 2007 again, before the shale boom, the companies are going to have to invest in deep water wells. And not only that, what happened? We had a war where, you know, Germany played tough guy and Europe played tough guy with Russia and we're going to put sanctions on you. Russia said, okay, well, you know, we supply with 40% of your energy and we're just going to shut it off. And, and, you know, Germany and Europe got very, very lucky because they had the mildest winter on record. Thank God, because people probably would have died. Uh, but they were like, wow, we are in a very difficult position and we got to find ways that to generate. And, 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 you know, we went too crazy into alternative energy, maybe not as much as we should have. Uh, now we need to find production outside of Russia, and they're spending billions and billions and billions. And what are they doing? It's rig the oil service companies as well, like Halliburton here. You know, Sombrage is okay, like Halliburton a little bit better, but they have huge exposure internationally, where that's where you're seeing a ton of spending come from. Even the Exxon and the Chevrons are, are, are good names as well. So, you know, just I, the domestic shell producers are going to get hurt the most. Their margins are still pretty good. You know, the technology they could drill. I visited, you know, boots on the ground research. Uh, I, you know, I visited every major shale area. Uh, you know, I understand the Eagle Four, the, the Permian Basin, just incredible, right? Uh, and, but the shale producers, you know, they could produce probably 45, 50, uh, which is still good with 60, 70 oil prices. But, um, you know, they're going to get hurt a little bit more than a lot of the other companies, which you saw. Maybe that provides a buying opportunity, but you know there are areas within a sector where the whole entire sector is not going to get nailed. And and you know, you know, you and I found it found you know a hidden gem in rig that's I follow for a long time. When back in the day, you know, I ran Jim Cramer's research department for a while on Wall Street, uh, but um, finally, you know, we saw that stock come back after years of being really garbage. So uh, and, and we pulled the trigger at the right time. So. Well, a lot of it was because of the shale boom. So there wasn't any need for deep water because all the onshore product, all the onshore production from the shale boom that was investing in a lot of it was unprofitable. So the deep water rigs didn't get business. And then the shale boom, all this um, uneconomic oil that flooded the market made uh, deep water offshore most wells uneconomic, except for Petrobras. Petrobras is really the exception because they have, a, I think their eight, their best eight producing wells are better than even Saudi Arabia right now. Yeah, no, it is incredible. And, and rig, I mean, that technology is unbelievable. I mean, just the day rates are so high. They have rigs that could that could drill two separate wells with the same ship. Uh, you know, they have their contracts locked in long term where you don't have to worry about the low oil prices. But it used to be ninety bucks, right? To, for them to, to to make it worth it. Uh, for people to, well, the, to oh, I thought you said the stock used to be ninety bucks. I remember when the stock was like one of the top oil stocks, yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. It's fantastic. You know, you look at the 10, 15 years ago, but you know, now the you know, the production costs have come down so much, right? And that's what you do with this technology and, and it's amazing, right? Shit. People don't realize the shale revolution, like how amazing that technology is, right? It's unbelievable. I mean, when I went to look at this and started in 2008, now this one uh shinier energy lng w- w- was looking to import energy and they're like wait wait, wait. now we're going to export natural <laughs> so they switched the whole facility but I, when i went there and seeing all the stories i thought i was going to see dead animals everywhere and, and then you notice that a lot of a lot of it's bullshit right it, it's you know you, it doesn't cause water contamination especially if these are the right things which they're using now but you know they, they have 
unless you f- you're fracking thousands of feet. I mean, you can go down 10, 12,000 feet. And that's why you almost have a limited amount of oil. And, and you know, geologists or whatever might say, Frank, that's crazy. It's not because if we get to the level where we see $200 oil prices, they're going to drill even deeper. And that's what makes the Permian one of the most amazing things in the world because it's been drilled for, you know, whatever, 90 years, 100 years. Uh, but if you look at the Eagle Ford and you drill, there's only like a, an area of 300 feet. That's the pay period where you drill in there. When you look at the Permian, there's about six, seven, eight different layers. The Mississippi, whatever, you know, they're all that. But if you look at the tech, they drill and they can go deeper and deeper and deeper. It costs more and it doesn't make sense to go. But as oil prices go higher, they could drill even further and frack even further. And unless, you know, by, by some, you know, the laws of gravity, you know, it, when you frack that always, you know, whatever they're using the frack actually travel up with the rock, you know, into war, it doesn't happen. I mean, you know, they could take all, all, you know, the, the water and dump it in, in a lake or something, you know, I'm not talking about that, but I'm looking at this technology. I'm like, man, this, this company really has, you know, not the company, but the industry has a bad rap. And you know, we generate a lot of money for our subscribers investing in that by, by seeing a lot of these things going there with experienced people, a guy's name that I went with cactus 30 years in the industry. I mean, he took me to 20 counties in Eagleford. He lives in the, by the Permian. And, and man, I just asked him a million questions over a week, uh, sleeping like small hotels. And, and at the end of it, I think he just kicked me out and said, you got to get out of here. But man, I learned a lot. <laughs> it was really cool. Well, you are a wealth of information, Frank. I've kept you for an hour. I really enjoyed our conversation today. We should definitely have you back on again soon. Yeah, and I'll have you back on our podcast. Uh, you know, I'd love to have you on, Jason. And, and and again, just you know, the back and forth is really cool. I love what you do. We know each other for a while, and I appreciate you asking me to be in the podcast, man. Thank you very much.